I'd like to start this talk with some uh, hands-on experience. So fortunately, some of you have your laptops here. Make sure that your laptops are open. Laptops open. You could try to do this from your mobile device, but uh, probably will work on, better on a laptop. And what I want to start is with this short game that we are going to play. And the game is called The Unique Game. And it's aimed at finding the, you, the most unique person here in the room. And the, the game has three simple rules. Rule number one, each one of you has to choose a number, an integer, a positive integer. And the, the goal of the game is to be the person that found the lowest positive integer that uh, he was the only person in the room to select that specific number. OK, so let's think about this for a second. You have to choose a positive integer. And, the, and the, you should be the only person in the room to select the lowest positive <coughs> integer. That's the unique game. OK, so uh, in order to oops, participate in this game, where did that come from? Uh, in order to participate in this game, the only thing that you have to type into your laptop is um, this shortener, G-O-O-G-L, I-O 2011 charts. Now, do you see the gauge there on the, on the bottom right-hand side? Uh, it should be gradually increasing as you guys uh, type in your votes. And what's nice about the slides in this presentation is that it's essentially it's one big website. And all the data visualization tools that you will be seeing essentially are live working on this website and the entire story that we're telling you about how easy data visualization is will be demonstrated by the fact that you will be entering data, we will be using that live data in the demonstrations and, uh, and essentially this is a website to, accessible to the entire, uh, to the entire world. Um, now that we have data, um, what we would like to talk to you about today is essentially two things. Uh, the first motto of, uh, of our team is to try to build charts for everyone. Um, and the, by charts for everyone, uh, we mean that uh, it might be a high school student that might be building a report, or my eight-year-old uh, doing some homework, or it might be a, a, a professor in the university, it might be a, 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 an entire company that's looking for a dashboard or a, a charting system to implement within the, within the organization. That would be the first part. And then the second part will uh, go into a bit hands-on uh, hands uh, demonstrations and, and some uh, experimentation that we will be able to uh, hold those laptops open and play around and see how, we, how the tools uh, are in action. Uh, luckily, we have uh, how, many, how many people here read XKCD? So I just want to make sure that uh, all of the jokes here are not lost. Cool. I expected more. You should read XKCD. Um, but uh, we have here a lot of the art of uh, Randall Monroe throughout the, uh, throughout the presentation, uh, who kind of took this uh, notion of data visualization into a very uh, humoristic and uh, interesting perspective in his, uh, in his XKCD comic. Okay, so uh, let's uh, start with the first part, and uh, let's explain what is Google's motivation to provide chart tools for everyone. So if you look about, uh, about a few steps that Google has uh, went through in the, la in the recent years, you notice that uh, we took a, a certain domains that were specialized domains, very focused for ex experts, and we tried to undergo a process of democratization of those domains. So for example, a cartography, we have a product called the MapMaker, we took in a notion that was available for only very few experts, and suddenly we said, well, everyone could make a map or make his personal map. And entire villages in India are now mapped just by the fact that the inhabitants of those, uh, uh, of those uh, villages are able to compensate for, uh, for the, the map requirements that, uh, that are needed there, uh, specifically in places where it's hard to generate uh, uh, maps with other techniques. Another very big uh, uh, step that we've done is uh, democratizing video. So until uh, six or seven years ago, if you wanted to reach an audience of a, a video with an audience of a million people, you, or seven million people, you had to be a big studio in Hollywood. And, uh, and we went through the process of, of, of saying, we want this to be available to everyone. We want any one of you to spend one afternoon Take a video of your two children biting each other and being able to reach, uh, being able to reach the masses. 
So again, democratization of video. And we've done this with other products like democratization of a, a 3D sketching and 3D a, a planning with our, a, a sketcher, a, our sketcher offering. And the question that I wanted to ask in this talk is could we democratize data visualization? Could we make this a topic that is not available for a narrow set of the ex experts, but rather something that is available for everyone? So why do we want to do this? Um, basically, a one chart is worth a thousand images, and we all know that an image is worth a thousand words. Uh, and let's take one example. So this is a, a nice demonstration from, a, again, from XKCD, where uh, what we have here is uh, the solar system depicted as uh, essentially gravity wells. And uh, uh, what the artist wanted to show in this, uh, in this illustration, here, this blue bucket here is Earth. And next to it, we have the moon. It's blown up here in this area. And you could see that uh, to reach the moon from Earth, you need a very big rocket in order to overcome the, uh, the gravity barrier. But in order to uh, fly back from the moon to Earth, there was a very small pod that just took off and, uh, and reached Earth because there's a very small gravity barrier in the other direction. So one good illustration, data visualization, could really uh, provide a lot, of, uh, a lot of information that is hard to, uh, to uh, describe uh, otherwise. One of my favorites, uh, this is a, a scatter plot. Um, it has your two axes, how easy it is to eat a certain fruit, how tasty that fruit is. We have here uh, seedless grapes that are easy and good, and grapes with seeds that are not so easy. Does anyone know how this uh, chart was titled? This was titled, Fuck Grapefruit. Let's understand why, okay? So grapefruit is, is all the way down here um, because it's, you know, no one likes to eat the grapefruit and it's difficult to eat. Um, we have here another great example, all from XKCD. Number of Google results for I, X have kissed her. So I shouldn't have kissed her, only 1,200 people have searched for that phrase, but 10,000 people are, uh, have searched for I should have kissed her, okay? And uh, that means that you should always kiss rather than not kiss, and I won't go into the third example. Um, okay, so, so the mission of, of our team is really to try to make the world's uh, structured data universally accessible and useful using a uh, visualization. And, um, and I'll try to iterate what I, I said earlier on. We really want our charts to be used by everyone. We want them to be accessible for everyone. Um, and that includes consumers, developers, and the enterprise users. So let's start with the consumers, okay? People that do not know how to code uh, might have a spreadsheet. They would like to visualize their data. And uh, for here, we have a, a very simple offering. Let's take a look at the... Um, at the spreadsheet offering. So this is a spreadsheet that actually has the live results from uh, the information that you've just collected. And now I could uh, very easily, um, with the tools that uh, my team has built, I could uh, uh, take a, a certain range of data and with one click get a breakdown of you know, how many people selected one, how many people selected two, how many people selected three. And by the way, who selected four? Yinon? What are the chances? <laughs> this looks fixed. <laughs> okay, so um, I always you knew you, you were the most unique person in the room. But, uh, uh, so there's always the smart asses that choose one, right? They say, oh, I'll be the only one that chooses one. But, uh, but uh, okay, so like with one click, I could get, uh, I could get, this, uh, I could get this chart. Um, and um, interesting uh, resolution issues that we're having here. Uh, add that to the chart. And what's nice of the, in, the, in our offering to consumers, unlike uh, you know, Excel or other uh, options that you might have, is that um, this is a, a web-based, a cloud-based solution. So if you want, you could, uh, with one click, you could uh, publish this chart and put it anywhere you want. So you get this. Uh, a snippet, plug it into your web page, and, uh, and essentially you're done. 
Um, and, and I think that's the, uh, you know, when I was in high school and I wanted to share results, I had to start emailing people and they had to start, you know, sending me back and there was no common way to, uh, uh, to have such a discussion. Um, and, now we, uh, and now we provide these tools for essentially everyone to, uh, to come and to uh, interact with data in a meaningful way. So that's our uh, offering for uh, consumers. And now uh, let's uh, skip that, which is probably less interesting for, for the audience in this room, and, and really focus on developers, which is you. So here we, uh, we really want to build a, an offering that's not only about charts. We really want to provide an entire stack for data visualization. And our stack is composed of three parts. So one, we have a very rich chart gallery. If you just write charts in Google, you will get to a website that says uh, Google Chart Tools, and you could uh, check it out. Uh, so we have a rich gallery of charts, and I think we're introducing new charts probably on a monthly, if not on a weekly basis. A second component that we have is what we call the, the uh, data table section, which uh, it's a data layer that all charts work on top of a common structure. So if you have that data table and you want to switch between charts, it's really just switching of one option because they all receive a standardized data table. And we have client-side tools for manipulating the data, selecting the data, um, and, and all of that is, uh, is encapsulated in a set of, uh, of client-side uh, data table tools. You could create different views over the table, and later down the talk, I'll, uh, I'll demonstrate how uh, the data table could be used. But then we go even deeper and we say, okay, we want you to communicate the data to the client in a, in a very seamless way. And we built a series of tools that could help you take your standard SQL database or any database that you have within the organization. And you might say, I want to expose this very easily. And we give you libraries in, in Java and in uh, Python that could easily wrap your data and, and provide it to a, a, and communicate it with a specific protocol a, to the client. So we really have a full stack of, uh, of tools that will help you to take the data from, uh, from within the, uh, the, the depth of the, of the data set all the way to the, uh, to the user's experience. OK, so let's do a short uh, example of, the, of how charts uh, could be customized, which is usually the, the key request that we get from developers. So uh, this example here shows um, who is more popular. Uh, Michael Angel, Leonardo, uh, Leonardo Donatello, and Raphael, and the comparison is between the artist and the Ninja Turtle. Okay, so you could see that uh, uh, at this point in time, Michael Angelo, the Ninja Turtle, is more popular than Michael Angelo, the uh, the artist. Um, and here we have a uh, here we have a chart that uh, demonstrates this. And what I'd like to do is to hop into our uh, environment, which we call our code playground. You could get to it from our documentation. And uh, you essentially start by selecting any, um, any uh, uh, visualization that you'd like, you know, whether it's a geo chart uh, like this one, or if, you know, in this case, we want to customize a pie chart. So we could go to the pie chart section. And you get a snippet already working with data already inserted into the snippet. And uh, you know, this is not the data I want. I just wanted the two slices, and I wanted the slices to um, to say uh, something like uh, maybe turtle versus artist, um, and uh, you know the that doesn't really matter. And I could say here, uh, who's more popular, um, and that that gives me the relevant text. But uh, if I run that, I get a, a revised version of the chart a, of the turtle versus the artist. Let's say plug in some more realistic data. So I know that 5,500 people a day search for the turtle, but only 4,500 people a day search for the artist. Um, OK. The colors are all wrong, right? You want to customize the colors. OK, no problem. OK, I just uh, defined the, the colors. And uh, I guess the, the turtle should be some shade of green. Um, sorry, square brackets. And the, um, and the, uh, a, and there should be like a brownish artist turtle. 
Here, our artist color. Let's see if that will work. Probably screwed that up. Okay. Ta 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 ta. And. Colors, good, good. Curly brackets, extra curly brackets. Oh, here we go, cool. Okay, so you see that customization is super simple. It only change the, only change the parameters, and we have very rich documentation that provides pretty much any customization option that, uh, that you might think of. Um, and that's how we could get uh, such a chart, and it's really a question of uh, two or three of minutes of, uh, of work. So if we take a stacked area chart that by default will look something like this, and we want to recreate the kind of black and gray uh, customization options that we saw with XKCD, we could uh, you know, el eliminate the axis, play around with everyone, everything that we want, and we could get, uh, and we could get, this, uh, uh, we could get this nice uh, visualization of the, of the gravity wells within our uh, solar system. So customization is a very big, uh, a very big topic for us, and they and really provide all the tools that you might need there. Uh, another aspect that we uh, emphasize in the last uh, few releases is the fact that we want to provide a richer data exploration tool. So we, uh, historically, we always had like a geographical view and an overtime view, but people said we want modular building blocks that we could combine together and play around in order to provide a richer uh, exploration. So what you see here in the bottom chart is a, a, in red, we have the popularity of Dilbert throughout the years. And in blue, we have the popularity of XKCD. How many people read Dilbert? Just to make sure that, has anyone ever read Dilbert? You're behind, guys. So let's do the following thing. Let's uh, see where Dilbert was a few years ago. So Dilbert, I think, started in, uh, in California. And you could uh, uh, tie the temporal view and see that XKCD starting sometime in 2007, gaining momentum, gradually becoming pretty much the choice for developers everywhere, okay? So a very simple connection between two of our tools just to provide an overview, overview of both time and geography, and you could uh, play around some, you know, some different uh, periods. If you want to say, like, get an annual view, you could uh, play around with it like this. And, uh, it's, it's very simple, essentially a few lines of code of just uh, uh, enabling this exploration on your website. Uh, and, and we're working very hard on generating uh, many, many other tools, uh, uh, adding new data sources. Uh, so we, uh, our spreadsheets are, are built in as a native data source, but you could pretty much uh, tap into your SQL. If you use fusion tables, you could now use that as well. And, um, and uh, a lot of, uh, if you go into our site, I think you will get on a monthly basis what are the new things that we're coming out with. Okay, cool. So um, uh, what we have now is, uh, is the summary of, uh, of the unique game. I see a few people have added votes. You know, you were just <laughs> thrown, <laughs> thrown out of the first place. Um, who's Uri Haramati? Is he here? So you're the grand winner. I actually prepared swag but forgot to bring it. <laughs> so send me an email and a swag will be coming your way. So Uri is the most unique person in the room right after you know. Um, but, um, so you see we've collected data real time, presented it on, a, on this chart and it's all summarized in just a few lines of code. Now, why do we have congratulations on the top? Because uh, we, what we would like to do is not only present this data on the web, we would like to have a system where we could come and say, send an email, an individual email to each and every one of you that says, here is your position within the chart and see how many people you know, have selected that same number. And uh, you know, if, you're num if you have selected number one, you could see yourself in the this section. I uh, selected number three, so I appear here. And uh, Uri uh, selected the number nine, and he appears here. He is the, that's the lowest unique number. And we would like not only to publish things on the web, but we would like to have a tool where we could uh, uh, send them out by email. And this is an example of a, a, a rich a direction that we are just now entering, where we would like to automate a lot of the processes within our organization, uh, like sending emails, creating dashboards, sending alerts, um, and connect them into a data-driven decisions. 
So for this, uh, I want to switch to our uh, second topic of the talk, which is uh, how to use charts in Google Apps Scripts. So I don't know how many, how many have heard of Google Apps Scripts? Like uh, five or six. So I'll give you like a quick introduction. I'll kind of skim through this because uh, um, it's really targeted for people that are familiar with the, with the Apps Scripts, but I do encourage you all to, to take a look and see what Apps Scripts could provide. Essentially, Apps Scripts is a, a, a JavaScript-like a, a scripting language. A, that's a completely live on the cloud and is aimed to tie together a, all of the apps experience and give you utilities to work and classes to work with all of, the, uh, all of the Google apps in a very seamless way. So it could be a pulling in data from calendar, pushing data to calendar, a pulling from spreadsheets, sending out emails, all of these processes that usually when you get an email from your boss saying, okay, create me a dashboard or send me a weekly email, I, summarizing a certain report, you're like, oh, I'll have to work on this for, you know, for a few hours and send this out every week. We would like to help you and really automate this process and make it a, a very seamless. So um, a, what we, what we a, provide now is a tool where you could easily a, pull in data. You know, we had the example of the, of the form that you all a, a filled out a few minutes ago. Pull, pull in data, have that populate a certain spreadsheet then have an app script that monitors that spreadsheet and says, you know, if a certain time has come, say for saying the weekly summary, or 50 people have already filled out this uh, form, or any logic that you would like, go and send a, 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 an email to all of the people in this form that filled out this form saying you are the winner, or you just got a voucher, you just got a coupon, or anything that you would like to, or here's the, uh, a, here's the summary of our uh, weekly sales. And in order to do that, it's, a, it's very straightforward. You have a, 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 an option to create a, a go in, create charts, and just define a new data table. We're doing this in line here, but obviously you could pull this data from, a, a, from any source that you would like. Um, and then we provided a, a, a tool within, within the, the environment of app scripts where you could create a chart. And the, the chart is created by a, just the definition of a, of a new column chart, setting the title, setting the dimensions, a, providing it the data table that was defined just a second ago. A, if you want it to be a stacked bar chart like we have here, you just set, set that option and you build the chart. So it's a, super simple. And then if you want to send an image of that, a, an image of that chart, a, you just create a, a, a blob file, a, a chart file, they give it a name and they take the chart blob that just takes the bytes of the chart and you use the mail app a tool in order to send the email and that's pretty much it. And a few months ago we've launched this in Google I.O. and everyone in the room got an email showing, a, a, showing his position within the, the competition and this was literally the code that we used in order to, a, a, to, provide, a, to provide that demo. Okay, so that was a, a few words on, the, on the app tools. And uh, now I want to uh, touch two more topics and then uh, dive into questions. So uh, one thing that we've observed is that uh, our code right now requires, a, this is pretty much a short snippet of how you could uh, create a new chart. Um, here's where it's pulling the data. So right now in this specific example, it's pulling it from spreadsheets. Um, and then um, you have to uh, create a handler on the query response. And this was kind of the traditional way to set up a chart. And all the way down here at the end, you have chart draw. Um, and what we tried to do recently is to create a new syntax that kind of summarizes this in a very compact way with what we call a chart wrapper. So a chart wrapper is a default way to initialize a chart. And uh, the only thing that you have to provide as options is all of those parameters in the code section that you saw in the previous slide, like a, give me an option that defines the data source, give me an option that defines the chart type, give me an option that has the div on the page, and the, the name of the div on the page, and that's it. And the, so the initialization is a lot more compact than what it used to be in the past. And in a second, I'll tell you why am I, why am I explaining about the, this chart wrapper right now. Uh, once you've created the chart wrapper, it's not the end of the story. You could easily alter it uh, by changing the chart type, and the chart will uh, change on the page once you call this uh, set chart type or, or set any option that you would like. 
Um, so this uh, serialization of uh, this uh, helps us, this new representation helps us in providing a serialization of the, of the chart type. And if you want to have a uh, provide your users on your website an option to save charts, uh, you could easily serialize it and, and get a, or, 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 or modify it and create it easily. And the code is a lot cleaner than what it used to be. Um, but there are a lot of exciting things that could be done once we have this uh, encapsulated definition of what a chart is. So one of the interesting things that we've built with this is a, a chart editor. What do I mean by a chart editor? I would like to provide our users with a, uh, with a tool that uh, they will be able to say, OK, I got the chart that you wanted to present, but I want it slightly differently. Okay? A winner of the unique game, what's your favorite color? Blue. OK. So say uh, I would like to, uh, to go and to say, OK, my winner right now is indicated in yellow, but that's definitely not the, uh, his favorite color. I would like to give him a, a different color. And uh, so let's choose maybe not, that, not the best shade of blue. Is that a good blue? OK. And now the, the chart on the website stored, saved, the wrapper serialized version, and blue is now the uh, defined color of the, of the chart. And you saw that the editing experience was very smooth. You just go in, you change the color, and this is a tool that now you could provide to your users in, in a full option of customizing, not only as a developer, but also as an end user of the, uh, of the, um, of the tool. OK, I'll skip the chart editor uh, example, but uh, we might be able to make these slides available uh, later on today. And you'll be able to, or you could go to our website and find examples of how to uh, instantiate a, an editor and how to play with it. But it's pretty much, as you see here, like seven lines of code, super, super simple. OK, so the last topic that we wanted to uh, present before we, uh, uh, before we conclude is the notion of dashboards which, uh, and, uh, and data exploration, which I uh, mentioned earlier on, but uh, is becoming a more and more important topic in the way companies uh, uh, make internal decisions and, and provide tools for external users. So we're often in a scenario where uh, uh, your boss comes and says, you know, I want by the end of the day, give me a, a pie chart of a breakdown of our sales. And then he says, oh, no, actually, I want it over time. And then he says, uh, I want uh, it for each division. And now I want to see it over geography. And you get these repeated uh, requests. And each one of them is like, I have to now build a dashboard for, you know, for my boss. And I have to start connecting all of these things. Um, and it's pretty much a nightmare. Um, and, the, and building dashboards is a, is a, is a key topic that uh, um, tries to address the fact that an individual visualization is great, but if you don't connect several visualizations to tell a full story, you're only getting at each given time only a very certain projection of the data, and you don't get to feel the entire data set. Um, now, the problem with dashboards is that they're connecting all of the data and saying, oh, this control should control these uh, charts, and this control should control these charts. And especially in a rich dashboard, it becomes, a, it becomes pretty much a nightmare to uh, maintain and to develop all of the dependencies between the, between the different elements within the dashboard. And this is what uh, we want to address in uh, the next two or three minutes by uh, launching a new set of very simple controls, a language of a, or a, a, a package of controls that give you a simple way to control your data exploration uh, experience. So controls, what do I mean by controls? You might have uh, controls that uh, introduce text or that choose a value or that uh, select a certain range. Um, and, and usually a dashboard is, has two sections. One is where you say, OK, here is the uh, narrowing down of the slice of data that I would like to focus on. And then there's the visualizations. So we've created a gallery of controls. You could see some of them here. They're, all of them are, again, very easily customizable. And, uh, and now we would like to use that as a building block in order to build that uh, dashboard that we mentioned uh, earlier on. Um, now, we already saw earlier on that in order to create a chart, the only thing I need to do is to instantiate a chart wrapper, give it the type pie chart, maybe some options, and an ID. Now, in a very similar manner, in, with the new library I've just mentioned of the controls, you have the control wrapper. 
Okay, the control upper does exactly the same. You give it the, a control type, like a number range filter, which is what we have here. Give it a few options, you know, maybe give it a name, salary, give it a minimum value, a maximum value, and give it again the container ID, the div on the page that uh, should present that uh, control. Now, in order to uh, uh, connect them together, what we need is what a new entity that we call the dashboard. And the only thing the dashboard does, it binds together controls and uh, visualizations. Okay, so you see the dashboard uh, class has a, a member called bind that essentially says this control should now dominate this chart. Okay, so it's super straightforward. And the only input that the dashboard receives is, a, is the database that, a, a, okay, the dashboard a, a database that a, a, the data table here that essentially says I provide the dashboard with one data table and all of the different slices are a, managed by, by the dashboard. And the only thing that the dashboard needs is a set of binding elements that says these controls control these charts. And that's it. And this is the code that will help you build uh, your dashboards from now on. Um, so we saw the chart wrapper, let's skip this. Uh, we saw the control wrapper, okay, that uh, is uh, the new section. And then we have the dashboard that kind of binds them. And uh, you could bind several controls to, severant, uh, to several uh, charts, okay? So we have here wrapper one and wrapper two controlling charts one, two, and three. You could even have a, a controls that affect each other. So occasionally you have a country selector and you want the country selector to a, a dominate a, a certain range selector, but that range is specific for that specific country. So a control could also a, a, a dominate another control. And if you think of it, it's like a, a directed graph of dominance where you define which elements control which elements down the flow of, that, uh, of, that, uh, uh, of the dashboard. Uh, let's wrap up with a quick demo. So, um, I think we have here a, an example where uh, uh, this would be just the chart wrapper. We have here the actual code that is running here. Um, let me see if this is indeed the actual code. Yes, okay. So you see I modify code on the left and it's indeed modifying the chart on the right. Um, and now we would like to add a control. So we have here a, a year selector and you see that in the visualization down here, which is a very simple, uh, a table visualization, everything is filtered down to 2008. If I, um, um, okay, if, uh, to, uh, to, sorry, to nine, uh, 1980, and if I change that, it automatically reflects on the, on the chart. Uh, here's our chart wrapper that we've played around earlier with. Here's the control wrapper, again, a few lines of code, and the key thing that binds them together is the dashboard um, that says, okay, take the, the year control, and just bind it to the chart that we've defined on the top. This is all of the code that you'll need to run in order to have the simple example. Uh, but then you might want to have a, a more complex example. Let's say, uh, oops, let's uh, skip ahead to a, a, say the full fle the full fledged thing. So I could have here a I think in this specific da a data set we have a life expectancy around the world, and you could see that life expectancy a moves between 43 years and 83 years, a, I could say, okay, give me all of the countries with high life expectancy, okay? And now say, oh, but I want to see who had life expectancy for a while now. And you could see that that narrows down a bit. A, and you could see that this control over here dominates this control down here. Suddenly it doesn't go from 42, it goes from 67 because I went back to a 1990s and that was the minimal value back then. And we have an entire dashboard that is just essentially one command, dashboard. Dashboard bind wrappers of a, of a controls to wrappers of charts and provide this full, uh, full interactive experience. Cool, so uh, uh, let's wrap up here and provide some, uh, some time for questions. Um, I encourage you all to go into our website. Um, we went through a, a major a recreation of the website to, to, uh, to help you find anything you need on uh, the website itself. We have a very active uh, discussion group on the, um, on the website, so you know, just feel free to uh, register to our uh, mailing list, and, uh, and uh, I think if you post the question there, like within a few hours, you get uh, all the resources that you might need. Thanks.
Any questions? So I want to make it as clear as possible that the answer is 100% no. You don't need to have your data at Google Docs at any stage. You could have, what, what, data, what database do you usually use? In so uh, look into our documentation. We have different degrees of wrappers for different types of, uh, of data sets. And uh, you don't have to have it. I just demonstrated it on, on, on spreadsheets just for simplicity. But you could essentially wrap any standard database that you would like. Um, and you don't ever send data to Google. And it's very obvious to us that uh, we only provide you with tools and utilities that will help you expose your data in the way that you feel comfortable with. Um, we essentially are trying to provide tools that will make the world's uh, data universally accessible and useful. Uh, Google does not, you know, uh, uh, does not require that you put your data on the Google Cloud in any way. Inside your what? Sure, sure. All of this is built in order to help you. All of the examples I provided, this is just a web page. It has nothing to do with Google. It's you know hosted in some arbitrary place. It's a... So all of these tools are available for you to build your next website with the data visualization that you might need there. Yes. Alexander. Oh, sorry. My name is Alexander. I'm from WeFi, and I have a question regarding uh, fusion tables. Mm -hmm. So how does it work uh, with, with the charts? Uh, actually, I, I've had some uh, slightly problematic experience with fusion tables. So I mean, maybe if there was some downtime lately, so maybe you could also explain about that. But my question is much more general. How does this work with fusion tables, and how uh, far Google is going to support like fusion tables? Is it like a living product? And, uh, so uh, I started out by saying that we have three components in our offering. One is the charts themselves. Previous question clarified that charts, for you could put them anywhere you want on your web page. They all built on top of the data table structure, that that's a client-side structure. And then the third component was the interface to different data sources. And uh, if you want to build your own data as a data source, you could do that. If you want to use spreadsheets as a data source, you could do that. And if you want to use fusion tables, we already have that built in as a native data source. So uh, hooking in a, a chart to fusion tables, you just provide the URL of the table in the, in the chart uh, wrapper. You just provide as the data source the URL of your fusion table, and that's it. Yes, yes. So we have a query language. There's a query language where you could do, you know, any uh, operation. Like it's a, it's like a subset of SQL, uh, where you could run any operation that you would like on the uh, server side. And this is very efficient in times where you don't want to download a lot of data to the client and rather send the query. If it could be processed on the server, it's processed on the server, and you get just the reduced result that you need to present in the visualization on the client side. Okay. Last question. Uh, do you currently have any limitations uh, regarding the size of the data sets that can be processed? So uh, the limitations are typically not the limitations of the visualization gallery, but uh, limitations of how much data do you want to send to your client. So if you're going to dump like a 10, 10 mega or 20 mega on the client, it doesn't seem like a good idea, irrespective of whether the, the visualization could you know, display it or not. If you think about a line chart that you, know, you, you allocate 1,000 pixels on the page, you will not show more than 1,000 points on 1,000 pixels. So there's no point in sending more data than that to the, uh, to the client. And that's the range that all of our charts are built to handle. Thank you. Um, great question. <laughs> Currently, the answer is n so the question was, uh, could, could this be used server-side in order to create uh, images of the, uh, uh, of the, of the chart? 
so the, the answer is no wish. Um, so it's not, it's not a clear, so there are a few limitations. I'm out of time right now, but uh, uh, we might be able to work together if that's like a very important use case for you. I think we have different creative solutions that we could uh, provide, maybe using a, like a canvas emulator and extracting it from there, but uh, we could talk about that. Okay. Thank you all.